provides this sampling function. And what you provide is then the compiled code, the data that we prepared, and then by default, um, it will call an inference algorithm. In this case, it uses um, um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, particularly the no U-turn sampler. And we're not gonna get into details into such algorithms. The beauty of probabilistic programming languages are that they're supposed to abstract you, abstract you from this very complex inference algorithm so that you can just focus on your matters. So the, the MCMC method that is used here is known as uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, particularly the no U-turns sampler. And I'll provide links um, so you could read a little bit more into these inference algorithms. So that is by default, it does that. And we're gonna um, run 2,000 iterations on four chains and we wanna use as many cores as possible for each chain that we're gonna run. And then there are some other um, control arguments here just to make sure that our MCMC doesn't diverge uh, or get stuck in a local, in a local optimum. So it's pretty fast to run this simple model. So I'm just gonna run it. And right now what's doing is um, it's sampling and it's already. Is, is this chain from the Markov chain? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so these are Markov chains. So uh, this is the output that you'll see and you'll see quickly that uh, this is taken really s uh, very small amount of time. Um, the first, I think this is, uh, the first chain we had 1.3 seconds, second one 1.0. So it's pretty fast, it's pretty fast. And uh, the reason why I say that is that um, traditionally doing MCMC, Bayesian inference, has been a very hard problem. And probably that's, what, that's one of the reasons why it's not really well ad uh, broadly adopted by the larger community. And that was because it was really, really hard uh, scaling up such, uh, such inference. And now with tools such as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, we're able to do this uh, within seconds. So, so you'll quick, quick, uh, quickly see there are some uh, iterations that were warm up. So by default, Stan will use half if you do not s if you do not specify how many iter um, iterations should be used as warm up, and then final sampling will take place in the the, the rest of the other half. So that is complete there. So let's look at the the object that was produced. Let's look at the. Um, comment that out. So we're going to extract the posterior distributions from this object that we just fit, because you, now you want to look at the posterior distributions in um, in the model that you've just run. So first thing that you will uh, recommend it to look at is um, a diagnostic statistic, uh, the R hat value. So you want to make sure that everything went smoothly before you can start looking at your results. And uh, a quick one would be the R hat value here. You'd want it to be around one, and that shows that it's uh, converged at a global optimum. And uh, this looks okay. It will be between one and zero. Okay. So at one, that's very good. Zero, that's bad. Point nine nine. <laughs> yeah, you'd want to have that as high as possible. Yeah. Um, so quickly we could see, it looks like everything ran smoothly, so um, we don't have to worry about divergence issues. And then another one would be your number of effective samples. Um, that's another uh, statistic that you should look at. And uh, if I remember correctly, uh, it should be more, 
number of effective samples? I don't remember. Do you know, Dr. Murphy? Higher is better. Okay. <coughs> and so once we've, um, but it should be higher than a certain threshold, right? should be close to the product of the number of iterations and the chains. Oh, yeah, yeah, now I, now I remember. We have four chains that we ran, and each one is, um, yeah. The sampling ones, and that was uh, a thousand of them, right? So once you've, there are other tests for performing diagnosis, but these are the two uh, quick ones that you can look at. And then after, after you've done that, then you can start looking at uh, posterior distributions of your, of your parameters. So here, for example, uh, on the intercept, uh, this is the, the mean of the posterior distributions. Um, and then we have intervals here that we can look at later. So this is the slope, and then this is the intercept here, and also we wanted to perform predictions, and since we uh, put that in the generated quantities block, we'll get that as well, print it out. But this is not really very helpful, looking at um, these parameters this way. The whole idea was to have probability distributions, and a graphical visualization would really um, cement that. So let me skip that first and then look at the, um, uh, the, the visualization down here. So this one here, we're using the base plot package, another package by uh, the team that wrote the stand program. And it has a couple of uh, functions to be able to uh, visualize posterior distributions of your parameters. So particularly here, we're going to look at the, uh, the MCMC intervals and for these three parameters. And from here, you could see we plotted MCMC intervals and a single point, a single, this dot here that we could see here, this round, small, tiny circle is the median of the values, and it looks like they are all concentrated around that median. Probably an, uh, this graph doesn't do that description justice, but we could look at the... Okay, the slope is zero? It's close to zero. So here, yeah. It's almost like a flat line. Uh, as we'll, we'll see later when I plot it out, it's, um, it's not exactly zero, but it's, uh, it's almost flat. the uncertainty around it is very small. And that's the whole purpose of using this probabilistic framework so we can be able to quantify all these uncertainties. So we'll quite uh, all the values that were simulated within um, some 95% credible interval are really very close. So as in the, it's this one here, and then this one here is also very compact. Um, if I do each one individually, this is what it looks like. So the slope, which 
Normalization of what? Um, okay. So those are our posterior distributions of uh, the parameters. And typically, you don't want to, although this, this is not really recommended, um, but you'd want to make some comparisons with a tool that used the um, traditional framework, and it usually has a single best fit parameter, right? If somebody used another technique, a linear model, and then used maximum likelihood estimation for that, they would have a single, uh, they would have a single value for the parameters, and you want to be able to make comparison. And so you could pick um, either the mean or um, the mod, um, in this case, I decided to take the mean of the posterior distributions so I could compare between the predicted values and, um, um, and the actual data. And so I wrote some function to perform the um, root mean square error and the maximum absolute error, and that's what we have in there. And if you plot out, so this is code, um, ggplot to code to just visualize what that single line would be like. So this is your the slope of um, negative yeah, 0 0.061. Let's see. Yeah, that's what I used here. And then all these black dots are the test data. Typically, in the Bayesian framework, you wouldn't use a single best fit value. You would average over all. Um, um, you'd average over all the um, the posterior distribution, and that is if you're uh, comparing with another probabilistic uh, framework. Then you'd uh, use the whole posterior distributions to to make comparisons. But here, in this case, I just wanted to make a comparison between um, um, the uh, traditional framework. So that is that was step four, I believe, the last step five. And then there are, like I said earlier on, there are other uh, tests that you could use to diagonalize and see whether um, whether your infer your uh, inference went smoothly. And another one of them is to look at the trace plots of uh, um, of the chains. So here we had one, two, three, four chains. And they all seem to be um, uh, coinciding with each other. And that's another uh, indication of if you don't have any chain that just went, went off the grid and diverted elsewhere. So that's another good uh, diagnostic that you can use. And then th there are some others. But generally, that's the, uh, that's the general idea. So you describe your model like we did using probability distributions. And then, without even knowing how this inference algorithm works, you just call it to perform inference. And that's w one of the strengths about this probabilistic machine learning framework. So, yes. Yeah. The Markov chain. So, um, this, so in most cases, you do not have um, an analytical solution for the posterior distribution. It could be a very hard probability distribution uh, of your parameters, and you don't have an analytical solution for it. It's very hard, or in fact, in some cases, it's impossible to do it. So what you can do instead is to simulate data that represents that distribution, you know? And that is the whole idea of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. You know, the probability distribution is very impossible to uh, create analytical solutions to for it, and so you just simulate data from that distribution. 
and it's Markov because it's sequential. Oh, so you, yeah, you already have an idea of what this is. Okay. Um, so that that's that's how generally Stan works. So let's see where else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so when simulating data from this high dimensional probability distribution, you want to be able to make very intelligent decisions on where to sample a point. And so um, one solution to do that is to be able to look at, um, compare um, sequential points that you've sampled. If one explains the data better than the previous one, then you continue searching within that same location. Location, so it depends on the previous one. That's why it's sequential in nature. Sequential, range in time. sequential, not in time. You could actually run different chains separately, but sequential in terms of the points being sampled. Yeah. So. So even for the most, so this is what we've just done. Um, let's see how we're doing with time. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we only have 10 more minutes. So there are tons of examples. Um, if you follow this link, there are tons and tons of examples that you can play with. Uh, the guys that, uh, who've developed this program here, have provided a lot of examples, and let's see what you can do. Uh, just later, oh, I don't think I have an internet connection here. Let's see, Wi-Fi, select. It's innovation, right? Yep. I just wanted to quickly show you lots and lots of examples that you can play with to get really comfortable with this framework here. So here in the Stan Dev repository, there are examples in here based on whole books that have been written. For example, if we look at Applied Regression Modeling by Gallman, tons of examples in there that you can play with. They're categorized by uh, model type as well. So plenty of examples in here. You have for single level models, for hierarchical models, for uh, linear, linear models in there. So there are tons of examples in here that you can play with later on. Yeah, it's on StanDev um, GitHub repo. Um, but um, maybe just to introduce one topic, and maybe later on we should look into m more details into what this topic is, uh, an area that I'm particularly passionate about that I use in my own research um, as a PhD student at uh, UNLV for my thesis are non-parametric methods. So in the previous example, we used a parametric um, a model, and what that means is it has a finite number of parameters that are used to fit the model. But in the non-parametric case, we're, we're, the idea is that you have an infinite number of parameters to explain your data. You do not know what the parameters are, so why specify them initially? And the challenge with the regression modeling is, for example, in this case here, um, you want to fit a, f a function to this data, but what function do you use? Initially, we uh, selected a linear function for our data in the example that we did, but is that any good? You know, maybe there are other functions out there that are good to model the such data, right? And if there are, uh, how many are you gonna evaluate? 10, 15, 100, until you finally get to the right function for your data? Um, and there are uh, examples out there people use pick a couple of models, four or five models, and then evaluate them on the data and then pick the best uh, 
the one that performs best on, on test data. However, that still has lots and lots of problems. You tested five, but there are an infinite number of other functions that you could use, right? So that's why, uh, and that's the motivation for this uh, non-parametric framework. So if you recall Bayes' theorem that we used, you know, where we had the posterior distribution of the parameters um, being equal to the likelihood and the prior distribution over the joint posterior distribution, we specified a function y is equal to fx plus additive noise. We specified it there as linear. But now in the non-parametric case, you want to learn that function. You don't want to say it's a linear function. You want to learn it from the data itself. So let the data do the talking, in other words. So, and so you want to be able to explore an infinite number of functions that could explain your data. And um, a common tool that is used to explore this infinite number of functions is the Gaussian process that I talked about earlier that Google uh, uses for its balloon uh, internet beaming uh, project. They use Gaussian processes to be able to um, uh, uh, pick up the functions that best explains trajectories of those balloons so that they can maintain uh, their position within, within that remote area. So um, it is called a Gaussian process because it has some similarities to the Gaussian, the standard Ga the Gaussian distribution that we all know. And just like the Gaussian distribution, it is, um, it has parameters, and these are the, the, for example, you have the mean vector and then the covariance. In the Gaussian distribution, you have the mean, a single mean, and a single uh, variance. In the Gaussian process, you have a mean vector. So now this is a whole vector of means, and you have the uh, covariance, function, which is also called the kernel function. And this is what it looks like here. So the whole idea is that you have this infinite number of, uh, uh, this infinite number of functions, but when you pull, just pull out a few of them, they simply have a joint Gaussian distribution. And this is what it means here. And I'll just skip over some of the math. So if you are able to use this framework here, you wouldn't have, in this figure here now, you wouldn't have a single line that describes the data. You'd have a whole distribution of lines that describe that data there. So this whole, the, uh, the, the thin blue line, I think that's yeah, the blue line. So that is your mean function that we talked about earlier. The mean vector, there are, um, points on that line, but because they're so close together, they form that function. And then uh, the uh, shaded green, green area here would be that covariance from the mean function. So in this area here where we don't have data, we are unsure about what the function is, and that's why uh, it's much wider. So in here, it could be any number of functions in there. We don't have data, and so we're unsure about it. But here where we have data, the functions kind of collapse to, uh, towards each other, collapse together. And there, we're very certain about what the function is actually in that location there. So we're very certain about what the function is in this area here. Uh, likewise, here, we have all this, this space here where the function could pass because we're uncertain about that area. We don't have data in this area here, so we're very uncertain. And so what we could do in a later experiment is you could collect data uh, in this area here and then rerun the model and it will collapse down and you'd have um, a distribution of functions that explain that data. So the Gaussian process was able to learn the right um, functions that explain the data. You didn't have to pre-specify, yes. So we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, in a bit. 
but they're, they're just samples from the uh, from from. Let's see. Yeah. So the whole specification then takes place within the covariance, and we're in the covariance function that we talked about in that Gaussian process uh, specification. It has the mean vector and the covariance. So the covariance just explains how similar the data are. So that's where you encode your prior knowledge uh, about possible functions that could explain this data here. So if, for example, in our example, the example that we used on uh, miles per gallon versus displacement, you'd expect the relationship to be linear, not very linear, but at least function um, points that are close together should be similar. And then that's what you would encode within this covariance function. So it has um, three parameters. You have sigma here for the noise in the functions itself. And then you have L here. And that L uh, is known as the length scale parameter. And that encodes your, similar, uh, your prior knowledge about the similarity of points. And then here you'd have um, no, um, the variance in the error. So basically, this is what you will play with, and you will try to learn. So L here is what will define the um, um, the the nature of your lines, whether they're going to be linear or they're going to be uh, periodic in nature. That's the L uh, length scale parameter, and we're going to try to infer that from the data itself. So the data will tell us that our function was linear or it was else something else. Um, let's see, I won't go into the code because um, we'll, we've run out of time, but I'll show some of the results here. So you'll still follow the same process, you know, define priors over those parameters, just as we've done here. Um, and then, so if we're to use those priors that we've just defined, we now use the Gaussian process equation that I showed earlier on and then sample from, from it. For example, here we've sampled four uh, functions. These are three. Are they four? I'm colorblind. <laughs> These are four functions that we've sampled from it. So essentially, what it's saying is at displacement 100 here, there isn't a single value where that f uh, the true function should pass through. There's a whole distribution of points and if we just take four, four of those points, four of those um, uh, points, this is what we'd get. So here, we'd get some points here, maybe um, 16.8 or something. Here we'd have 17.7, um, and then here they meet. Yeah. And because those points are cl quite close together, yes. with white noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. No, d depending on the data that you'd have, it'll find patterns in that data. So if your data has a lot of noise, um, and yeah, exactly. So it, it wouldn't find any structure in there. So you're, because you're learning from the data itself. So if the data is messed up, then your, your inference is as good as terrible. Oh yeah, so there would be um, a lot of, there would be spread out such that and I'll show an example maybe later on. They'll be spread out, and you'd have no structure at all. It wouldn't sh show any structure. No, you, it would converge, but the the points that have been um, the points that have been sampled would be far apart from each other. So it would just go all over uh, the, the the space and just pick just about any point.
set of things and learn to control enough noise factor, you would end up with a range of sound. It wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily be back on single, it would, you know, like everybody who agrees with these things. But you sort of, you, you sort of began, what you notice is the noise is probably closer to So um, let's talk about that offline. Let's uh, try to finish here so that these guys can um, can close up. So for in this case here, I sampled from that Gaussian process over 2,000 functions. And it didn't do a very good job, but at the mean uh, function, this is the red one in there is the mean function that was learned from the data itself. So it was able to learn this from the data because we, uh, we didn't specify that it was linear or polynomial to a certain order. It learned it from the data itself. But we still have um, very large, very large uh, variances around this mean. And that will mean um, so we need to collect some more data, maybe improve our our fit. That is the Gaussian process at a high level that I just wanted to introduce, and maybe uh, at, a, at a later time we could look into the mathematics and the details of this and be able to run the code. But I did provide the code as well, so you can run that. Um, yeah, and that's it. So references are here uh, at your own time. Look at it and then you know play with that. So oh, we're gonna. Um, and the discussion right now, but we could have the, some other discussions offline. All right, thank you.